Good morning, church. If you don't have a Bible this morning, please slip a hand up. We want you to be able to have a Bible in your hands so you can follow along. Merry Christmas, everyone. What a sweet time of worship, huh? No? Just me? <laughs> Thank you, Suze, for that. Um, a couple of quick announcements. Um, one, I'm kind of excited. Normally, we don't move dates or events because of things going on, but I'm guessing the ladies' thing was moved because we got invited to a cool Super Bowl party or something. No. Oh, no. <laughs> so we haven't yet been invited to a cool Super Bowl party. Anyway, a couple. so also, if the Lord laid on your heart during that, you know what? I should be serving in the nursery. I'm going to ask that you wait till the end of the service to go see Betsy. Okay, don't do that now. And the other thing, there's been a bunch of questions about the marriage conference. I want to encourage you to come. Um, there's been questions about if you're not married, if you can come. Um, if you got a ring and a date, you can come. If you don't have a ring and a date, come see me before the first Sunday in January, and we'll see what we can do. Um, trying to think if that's it. Oh, also want to encourage you guys. Yes, we are in James chapter 4 this morning. Um, but I want to encourage you guys to invite people to join us tonight. Uh, tonight's going to be a short, sweet service. We're going to talk about what it is that we really celebrate on this day, and that without Christmas there couldn't be Easter, or there couldn't be a resurrection day, and it's what our faith and our salvation is all based upon. So, plus it's a good day, short church, right? Good time to invite friends and expose them to the madness of this family that we have here. So, um, so I want to encourage you guys to attend. Five o'clock tonight, it'll be less than an hour. Kids will be in here with us, so mostly a time of songs and, and praise and uh, a short message and it'll end with fire, candlelight, right? Try not to drip on the chairs. But we are resuming our study in James this morning, James chapter 4, because that is our practice. And I think our time is short here before Jesus comes back again. So the more Bible we can teach, the more we can educate. Also, one more thing on the marriage conference. Don't think that you're going to blow it off and then watch it online. Okay, it's not going to be recorded. It's not going to be posted so that the people that are sharing can have freedom to share personal stuff. And uh, so anyway... What a place to be on uh, Christmas Eve, James chapter 4. He, he presents some hard truths for us. And although typically we don't always enjoy that, uh, it, I think it's a gift. There's been so many things in the book of James so far that I've, I've seen as a, not just a wake-up call. I know one of our messages was titled a wake-up call or smelling salts or something like that. But really just a, a reality check because I think it's pretty easy to get a messed up perspective of ourselves when we only look at ourselves. Right, I got married to this beautiful woman over 31 years ago. Um, and I'm a better man than I was when we got married. And I'm a different man than I was even 10 years ago or five years ago. And if it was the old me that was the standard to shoot for, then, then I'd be doing pretty good. You know, but James says stuff like, I should count it all joy when I fall into various trials. Because those trials will actually produce something in me. They give me patience, which will produce something in me and change me and make me more like Jesus. And I read that and I think, okay, there's some room to grow. And he tells me I should be slow to speak and quick to listen, especially when it comes to the things that the Bible says. I'm to lay aside every form of wickedness in my life all the time. And I, I shouldn't favor certain people over other people, especially just because they have 
money or they could help me in some way or it would be to my advantage to be friends with them. And then ah, he talks about the tongue, right? And the, the words that come out of my mouth because they tell the story of my heart. And in the words that come out of my mouth in the parking lot or in a, at a job site or, or something like that really kind of validate or invalidate everything that gets set up here, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a mirror for you or a picture of what's really going on inside. That, that my words wouldn't tear people down. That my words, no matter where I am, would be words that would build people up. Those are just a few of the things that have stood out to me as we've gone through the book of James. And maybe the, the list is the same for you, or maybe it's not. Maybe you don't even have a list. Maybe your faith is a real faith and a living, saving faith, and your walk lines up exactly with your talk. And if that's the case, then praise the Lord. But in this chapter, I think James has something for every single one of us. Morning, Sarah. Sorry to call you out. I just remember 10 years ago today, we dedicated your little boy, Isaiah. Isn't that cool? Sorry, things bounce, you know. James 4. The last time I thought, taught through James 4, so the richness and the heaviness of this chapter, I broke it up into three sermons. And we're not going to do that this morning. We're going to kind of look big picture at things hopefully make it all the way through. Um, but to begin, I want to just read through the chapter so we can get a big picture oversight of it. So James chapter 4, verse 1 says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and you war Yet you do not have because you do not ask. Let me interrupt myself. Do you remember who James is talking to? He's writing to Christians, right? So you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss or you ask in the wrong way that you may spend it on your pleasures, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, like when the Bible says this, it's wrong. The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a verse ahead. I didn't read that, did I? Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's a good message. Verse 8 says, Therefore, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Timely with our Wednesday service on huh? Lamentations. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother or judge and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are a doer. You are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? That's the title of our message this morning. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. 
That's where I was afraid you might jump to the nursery. Let's pray. Father, God, even as I, as I read this again this morning, I'm humbled by the depth and the wisdom of your word. So Lord, our, our prayer this morning is that you help us to get it. Help us to understand what you want us to see. And help us as a church to live this out in the days ahead. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a reminder that when James wrote this letter, the chapter breaks and the verse numbers weren't there. They were later added by the publishers. I think most of you guys know that, but it makes it super easy for us to today turn to the same place. So we're on the same page. But in this case, James is really continuing the, the thought of controlling the tongue and the things that we say and then our conduct, those things that he addressed at the end of chapter 3. And I'll just go to the very end of that, James chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. He says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show. Let him do it, right? Let us see it. Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, check it out, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Verse 18 says, Now the fruit of the righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And then James lays it out for us. In chapter 4, he addresses the, the hard issues in the church and the consequences that we see that people would war and fight, right? Verse 1 of, G, of uh, James chapter 4, where do wars and fights come from among you? W within the church, with Christians. Do not they come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? First off, understand that this was written 2,000 years ago. Okay, so surely they were just figuring out church life, right? How to be Christians together. Christians don't really still fight, do they? There's not disagreement and strife and bitterness and argument today in the church, is there? The sad reality is that peace and unity in the church is not the norm. I, I think it is here. I, I do believe that it's different here. We're, we're very intentional about keeping it that way. But I want you to notice something about the way James addresses these conflicts or, or the things that he does and the things that he doesn't do. James says that there's fights and that there's wars among each other. Like that's, that's a very descriptive term, isn't it? When we think of war, we think of violence and hatred and, and uh, destruction. And that's really what fighting is among us. But James doesn't say, okay, come in and sit down and let's talk about this. Right? Come schedule an appointment, come in my office, and, and you tell me everything about what she's doing wrong and how you're right. And, and then I'll listen to you, and you can tell me everything that he's doing wrong or they're doing wrong or the beef that you have or the issue. Let's, let's talk about the issue. There's none of that with James. To James, it's almost as if the topic of the fight or the issue of the debate doesn't matter. Right? He gets right to the issue of the heart. What matters to James is why are we fighting? Not what it's about. 
don't they come from your desires for pleasure? Isn't that really the, the root of the issue? Self-gratification of your flesh rather than yielding to the Spirit of God. All fights, wars, battles between Christians are the result of this. I had a discussion with somebody yesterday and, and we talked about this kind of being a principle. But I want to double down on that and say, no, it's, it's, it's every time. And it's all the time when there's disputes between Christians. Because two people, two Christians being led by the Holy Spirit and dwelled by the Spirit, yielded and submitted to the Holy Spirit, should never be in a position of warring and fighting with one another. And if they are, then at least one are being led by fleshly desires for pleasure. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. And the Holy Spirit can't be divided against himself. Right? So if there are issues and fights from among us, it's time to examine, not to point fingers, but to understand the truth of the word of God. And listen, that's something else that we need to understand. Just because we believe something doesn't mean it's true. And just because we feel doesn't mean it's real. Right? The word of God is truth. And this is what it says. Here's where they come from. Doesn't matter the issue, doesn't matter the topic. When two believers are in conflict, they come from your desire for pleasure that war in your members. The Holy Spirit can't be divided against himself. So someone is dealing with a heart condition. And James is saying that these, these heart conditions, they're what wage war in our churches. It's these heart conditions that wage war in our homes and in our marriages. And we don't want to admit it when it's us. But the Bible says it's so. If Nicole and I are fighting about something, what does that tell you guys? I'm, right. <laughs> I'm probably right and she's wrong, right? No. It means I'm being stupid. I'm not yielded to the Holy Spirit. And there's a war going on in me. Right? That's what James is talking about. Does that really happen? Christians being, I mean, we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Should we still be struggling? Are we still battling? Man, sometimes we feel like I'm being sanctified, right? The Lord's changing me. And, and my life should look like what this short little letter explains. But it doesn't always happen, right? I mean, maybe it does for you. I'm just saying for me, it doesn't always happen. And when it doesn't happen, that can almost wreck me as much as it not happening. Right? We get discouraged and the enemy wants to come on and, and defeat us. Kill, destroy, steal. That's what he wants to do. And then, you ever get to the place where, why bother trying? Could God still forgive me? Why would he? Or we get down on ourselves and we feel like, well, I'm, I'm not in a position to share or to, to tell anybody else when I have these battles going on within me. What encourages me at times is the Apostle Paul, who, who the Lord used to write a significant portion of the, the New Testament. He says this in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 7. He says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I'll tell you what, anytime you want to take a stand for Jesus, the devil's right there. Your enemy's right there, or one of his minions. I don't think the devil cares about us much. 
Evil lies close at hand, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. This is Paul saying, I love the Lord. I love his law. I delight of that in my heart, but I see in my members another war, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. We've been made perfect in Christ, but yet we're not fully sanctified. There's still a battle going on. And, and that's why it's so important, gang, that we begin our day with prayer. That, that we begin our day with a time in the Word. He, sidetrack, but it's imp- it, this is why it's important that you come to the marriage conference. One of the reasons. Listen, if in any other aspect of our lives, if, if you stopped putting fuel in your car, or you stopped doing the maintenance of putting oil in, if you stopped eating, I could probably go a while, but if you stopped eating or you stopped drinking, you're going to run out of gas, and you're going to wither and fade and eventually die. That's why the, like the marriage conference is not just for problemed marriage or troubled marriages, right? We're, we're feeding our marriages. We're strengthening our marriages, becoming aware of these things, putting fuel in the tank. That's why we start our day with prayer. That's why we start our day in the word of God. Because there's this war going on, not just around us, not just the spiritual war, but still within us, this, this flesh that we have. Uh, James 4 verse 2 you lust and you do not have you want stuff and you don't have it you murder and covet and cannot obtain you fight in war yet you do not have because you do not ask and those that do you ask and you do not receive because you ask in in the wrong manner you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures This actually makes pretty good sense when you consider the state of the heart that he's talking about. We're not to lust, we're not to murder, whether in the flesh or or in the way Jesus talked about, that murder starts in the heart when we hate people. We aren't to covet what someone else has. And I wonder how often this happens to to you or to me. We have not because we haven't asked God. We haven't turned to God. We haven't talked to him about it. We haven't prayed. We've just talked to everyone else. Or talked to our hundreds of friends that we don't even know on social media. We've loudly complained, maybe even pouted a little, but we never took it to the Lord. Or there's this other issue where maybe we do talk to God or at least talk at God. Right, God, here's what you need to do. We ask wrongly. Amiss, again, simply to gratify our flesh or our pleasures or our desires. Verse 4 he uses harsh language here to his audience, to his char- church. Adulterers, adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I imagine this is kind of startling to some of you guys when you hear that. Perhaps you think it's wise to be a friend of the world. To fit in. So we can witness. Jesus said this. In John 15, 18, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. See, when when James and Jesus is talking about the world, it's the, the world system. Right? The rule of man not the rule of God. It's the world 
and those of the world and their misplaced pride of elevating themselves to a position of self-rule. No longer seeking God for direction or for wisdom. James says, if we want to be a friend of the world, then we're at enmity. Anybody use that word this week, this month, or so far this year? Probably not. Hatred with God. That's what it means. Enmity. Hatred with God. We're, in a sense, being an antichrist. And we're not submitted to him. So, let me ask you this. You're hearing this today. Again, if I didn't say it when we started, Merry Christmas. Uh, and maybe you weren't aware of this before this morning, before hearing it. And that's what I mean. It's a, a big hunk of truth. Does that mean you're going to hell? If you've shown friendship with the world. I, I mentioned before, probably also shocking to some of you, that sometimes I do stupid stuff in my marriage. In our marriages, we can be at enmity at times, right? It doesn't mean that we're no longer married. We just need to fix it. And it's the same thing here. When you, when you come across the truth in the word of God, where it's revealing something to you that's not right in your life, and it's, and it's a matter of understanding now what it means to be a friend of the world, and I don't know if I explain that fully, what it means to be a friend of the world. So 1 John 5.19 says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. That's the deal. The rule of man and, and the world and the man system, they're, they're under the sway. They're under the deception of the wicked one. So now that we know that, why, why would we want to be a friend of the world? Right? that system of man's rule that's not submitted to the Lord. And then James, if you remember, he asked this question, or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Let me ask you a quick question. When you hear the word jealous or jealousy in our time in this world, is jealousy a good thing or a bad thing? In general. Bad, right? That's how I would think of that. Jealous, selfish, creep kind of thing is the image we get in our mind. <clears throat> Most of the time it is. But this jealousy that the Bible talks about is different from your jealousy or, or different from my jealousy. Our jealousy is about us, right? Our jealousy is about my wants and my needs I need my wife, right, so I can get jealous. But even when I try not to let it be that way, my, my jealousy is about me and how much of her I have or whether it be her time or, or her attention, but it's really about me. The jealousy of the Lord isn't the same as that, right, not even close to that. God's jealousy is, is pure, and God's jealousy is because he loves us and he wants the best for us. So it's not his motivation um, for selfish pleasure, but he wants the very best for us. God doesn't need us. He loves us. He desires relationship with us. But he doesn't need us. He's God. He wants to bless us. He wants us to have joy. He wants us to have peace and security and self-control. So he's jealous for us. And the spirit yearns, it says, for our surrender to him and not our flesh. Right? That war that's going on. Now, when we look back to verse 4, where he calls us adulterers and adulteresses, we have to remember that James was the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. Right? So his audience was, was mostly Jews. 
right? More Jews than Gentiles that had come to Christ. So, so he's writing in a language that they would understand, right, from their Old Testament heritage, that, a language that they would be familiar with. But we have a similar picture in the New Testament where the church is the bride of Christ. Right? We're the bride, and he is the husband. So when we put things or people or even ourselves above him, we're, we're doing the same thing. We're committing spiritual adultery. And the world can be one of those things. We have an example in the Bible of a guy named Demas. You guys remember Demas and his story? A little blip of a story we have that um, Paul writes in his letter to Timothy. It says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, he has departed. Right? And the implication there is that he's left Paul, he's left the ministry because of his love for the world. And we don't know the rest of the story. We don't know if Demas came back. I hope he did. But the Bible doesn't tell us that. His love for the world drew him away. And James tells us in verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You guys ever tried to walk against the current? Um, some of you guys have hiked uh, what we call the Grand Canyon of Maine or Gulf Hagus, and at the beginning of that hike, you have to ford a stream, right? And, and depending upon the time of the year, it can be like at your ankles and you can kind of rock hop across it. And then other times of the year, it can be up above your knees. Um, it's not wise to face resistance of that level. If you want to hear a better story about tides and resistance, you can ask Suze about my Mother's Day gift to Nicole several years ago. The whole family almost drowning in the ocean. But <laughs> Parents, redirect. Parents, you've experienced resistance, right? Especially if your kids have lived to be teenagers. You've experienced resistance. A, a common definition is the, the refusal to accept or the refusal to comply with something opposing or withstanding. So understanding that, look again at this verse. Is that the kind of relationship you want to have with God? Him opposing and withstanding against you. That's what pride brings. But to the humble, he gives grace. The logical course of action, then in verse 7, therefore submit to God. All right, tap out, make it easy. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Does it always feel that way? No. But here's the instruction of the word. And, and a lot of times we get this verse quoted at us, and this is where it's important to see the full counsel. It's, it's not just resisting in our own willpower and our own strength. But verse 8 says, draw near to God. Resist the devil and he will flee, but draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Do you ever feel like God isn't close to you? Pursue him. And the Bible promises he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. That, what I mentioned earlier about when we fail or when we sin, call it what it is, and we get discouraged and we start feeling defeated and, and like, I don't even know how to find my way back to God. Pray, open his word, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you and he'll lift you up. He'll do the work. He's always done the work. Right, that's what... That's what, what we call Christmas is all about, right? None of us were good enough. None of us could make it on our own. So he gave us the gift of his son. And, 
And I don't know what's going on in all of your lives or those that may be watching online. James is all about doing, right? Not just the faith, not just saying, but having evidence of a real faith in our life, doing these things. But listen, there's nothing that you can do, and I'll just say it, even serving in the baby nursery, that will make God love you any more than he does right now. And because it's not based on works, there's nothing that you can do to make him love you less. He's crazy about you. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you, lift you up. Understand who you are in light of who he is. Right? That's humility before the Lord. James tells us in verse 11, do not speak evil of one another. Here's why I don't listen to it when you try. Don't speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. And he goes on to say there's just one of those. There's one lawgiver who's able to save and destroy. And that's not you and it's not me. Who are you to judge another? Those are humbling words. Come now. He doesn't say where, but come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Maybe that makes sense to you, maybe it doesn't. We do it in all kinds of different ways, right? How many of you, when you were like 12, knew what you were going to do for the rest of your life or had a plan? I love it when people are new to the church and they, Pastor, what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? We'll see what the Lord has for us tomorrow. And it, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't plan, right? Proverbs talks all about wisdom and, and planning for the future, but to say I'm going to do this or to say I'm going to do that, and that's the deal. Or we're going to retire in five years and go here and do this. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And then this. What is your life? What, I don't know what your holiday plans are. If you're gathered with family and you've got family that, that aren't Christians or you go to a work party or something like that, and you were to ask this question or pass out secret ballots so people could fill it out, what do you think the answer to that would be? What is your life? My life is my life, right? My choices, my body, my choice, um, my will, my way, my plans, my future, all the things that I have, that's, that's part of my life. I mean, what? What would go into answering that question? I got one shot at this. Right? I'm going to do it my way. It's my life. What is your life? James asks the question, but Paul actually answers it for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. He says, Or do you not know... That your body, again, he's writing to Christians. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. Remember that verse about your life as a vapor that he said? Think about how long a vapor lasts. I mean, I know we've had some heavy fog lately. But you get out of the shower and there's steam in the room or you boil a kettle of tea and it lasts for seconds. And that's, that's what the Bible compares our life to. So what is your life? And what in your life matters? And then Paul says, you're not your own, Christian. For, here's why, verse 20, of 1 Corinthians 6, for you were bought at a price. And what was that price? Jesus. Holy, pure, sinless Jesus. 
dying in your place, paying the cost of your sin. So your life is no longer your own, Christian. You were bought with a price, therefore, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your life belongs to him. Paul understood this. Paul understood that he actually deserved hell. But rather than receive what he deserved, God gave him grace. God gave him mercy. And those things weren't free. They came at a price. And it was Jesus that paid that price. So in Galatians, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no, this should be like, different people have favorite verses, different people have life verses. This should be it for us. I've been crucified with Christ. What is my life? What life? That's what Paul would say. What life? Oh, that, that thing I used to have. I don't have that anymore. Because I was crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So he says in verse 15, so instead, you ought to say, if the Lord lives, we shall live and do this or that. It's not what I want, it's what God wants. That's my life now. He says, but now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Those that are fighting and, and not doing these things. Boasting is vanity. Boasting doesn't belong to us. And then he ends with verse 17. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not, know, and does not do it, to him it's sin. If you've spent five minutes in a church, you know all about sins of commission, right? These are the bad things and don't do the bad things. That's sin. But what he's talking about here is, is sins of omission, right? When we, when we know we're supposed to do something because knowledge of right and wrong brings responsibility. And this isn't just James. Jesus says the same thing. In uh, Luke 12, he says, But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, that's us, from him much will be required, and to him much has been committed of him. They will ask the more. To everyone who's given much, from him much will be required. This is where James calls us all on the carpet. And this letter isn't a pep rally. It isn't an encouragement to just try a little harder. And this last verse, he says, that I've, I've laid it out for you guys. Not if you fail to act, you, have, you fail to have faith that results in works, or, or you're just too busy. He says, no, it's sin. Let's call it what it is. Again, we, we understand sins of commission. Thou shall not covet. Thou shall not lie. They shall not have any other gods before me. Here's the bad stuff. Don't do the bad stuff. But this, if you know to do good and you don't, to you it's sin. I had a situation yesterday where the Lord told me to do something I don't normally do. And I didn't really want to. But I was teaching on this verse this morning, so you know how that is. Kind of had to, you know the stricter judgment and all that that James talks about. And I won't tell you what it was, but I will say that the Lord completely blessed it and turned it into something I never saw coming. And 
blessed me for allowing him to be a part of it. So, my encouragement this morning, let's listen to his still small voice as we interact with other people. And let's read his word for his clear and direct and loud instruction. And when we know we're supposed to do something, let's follow through with it and do it. I think that's consistent with what James has been saying. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the, I don't know, the raw reality of it that you cut to the chase. And, and Lord, I'm mindful even now as we, as we pray and that you would lay people on our hearts to invite for this evening. Lord, that we know that we should. Maybe we're afraid of the response or rejection. And our job is to, to obey. And your job is to do with it what you will do with it. So Lord, would you, would you speak to us, not just on that thing. Speak to us, Lord, about our lives no longer being our own. And how often we let our plans and our agenda dictate what we do without considering we've been bought by a price. And our lives are yours to do with what you would will. Help us to be sensitive to that, Lord, today and every day going forward. And then help us to do these things, Lord. You, you say that your word, your law is now written on our hearts. So as much as I love a, a manual with instructions, Lord, we, we have your word, but like you did yesterday, you, you direct us to do things. So Lord, help us to be sensitive to that and to do those things so that we're not in sin before you. Thank you, Lord, for the birth of your son, for his sacrifice, allowing for our salvation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.